You're listening to the Frugal Crafter Podcast. I'm Lindsay Wyrick, and today we have Lisa Clow, the artist behind Lockery Fine Art with us. She has been on YouTube for over a decade, runs a successful tutorial business on Patreon, and even has her artwork featured on the Derwin Ink Tense Tins. Lisa, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's been, I've been, you've been on my list since day one of people I want to interview because you're so interesting and you always have such fun things on your YouTube channel to watch. Thank you. I think most of our viewers are familiar with your YouTube channel, but I'm curious as to how you got started in art because you already had quite a skill set by the time you started your channel. Yeah, I've been drawing. Like like everyone says, since I could hold a pencil, but I was sick a lot as a kid. I have an autoimmune disorder, so I wasn't, I was just always sick. So I stayed inside and colored. And then I started getting mad when the drawings and the coloring books weren't good enough and started trying to fix the drawings and started drawing from there. So I've just always, you know, drawn a lot. I, when I was about 19, I remember going to the beach and with a friend and seeing a lady was doing marine life. That was my big thing at the time. She was doing marine or had this booth with marine paintings and she's selling them for like $5,000. Now this is back in around 98. So $5,000 back then I'm like, she's rich. Well, she was at Laguna beach. So she probably was, but I, w I looked at that thinking if she's making that much on those, I'm going to be rich. Mine are better than that. Yeah, 19 year old wisdom. I did not understand that's how art, art doesn't work by that, that standard. But that was my moment of, you know what? I think I want to be an artist for a living. I was 19 at the time. I, I thought I was going to do graphic design or I really wasn't sure. I was bouncing back and forth on, on what I wanted to do. And so I just took off from there and just started painting constantly. But that's really where I got started. Oh, that's awesome. How'd you come up with your channel name, Lock Refine Art? My mom used to breed basset hounds and Himalayan cats, Shih Tzus. Um, so the, when the breeders back then, well, I guess they still do now, they have a kennel name and she combined my name and my sister's name, Christy and, La and Lisa. And that's where that came from. And so when I started painting and drawing, when I decided I wanted to do this as a living for a living, I, I hated my maiden name. I didn't, I, and I know I'd get married someday and I didn't want that name changing. I just wanted something that was solid and that I was just going to use forever. And La Cree just sounded fancy to me at the time because, you know, well, it's made up. So yeah, it's a combination of mine and my sister's name. Oh, that's really no, she sweet. Do I love that. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, what would you say is your, oh, you mentioned marine art, but what would you self-classify your style and genre of painting? Photorealism mostly and surrealism. Uh, those are my favorite. I love anything wildlife is my, I mean, I do portraits, but I really love wildlife and surrealism. Anything that's a little bit unexpected is my favorite. I do a lot of normal, like just portrait of a tiger head because that does well for students for getting everyone started. Plus they're fun to do. But like the thing that I'm most passionate about is marine life and anything that is just un, anything unusual. Um, I just finished a painting that it's a road going into the mountains and there's a humpback whale swimming above it. So, you know, just weird stuff like that is definitely where I'm most passionate, but in a photorealistic style. When you were doing that painting, did you like start off painting the road and then all of a sudden it occurred to you to paint the whale or did you kind of start off with the whole concept in your mind? How, how did you come up with that? <laughs> In that case, I actually started with a whale. So I knew I wanted a humpback whale swimming in a forest. Uh, originally, it was going to be a forest. So I go to Unsplash, and I'm looking at reference photos because I live in Texas, and we don't really have much in the way of forests, so I can't just go get photos easily. So I'm on Unsplash looking for royalty-free stuff, and I found one that I loved, and it just kind of built from that. So I, I actually started with the idea of a whale not in the ocean. Oh, cool. Um, I see you have a passion for animals. I can just hear, I think I hear birds chirping in the background. Yeah, my canaries and I... in the background. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you, can you talk about how they influenced your art? Uh, do you talk about they keep me... anything yeah, about I animals mean, I, there? Well, for me, I don't leave the house. I leave the house like once a week. I'm actually not exaggerating on that. So uh, I kind of turned my home into my own zoo. I just, that's who I spend time with all day long. My husband's away at work. I'm here with all of my, my critters. So, I mean, I've got my reef tank, has, which makes sense with the marine life. So I've got the, the reef tank, which 
it was supposed to be one fish tank, but then you find out, well, I need one for quarantine and I need one to quarantine the coral with. So now there's three technically, but I call those supports. So they don't, they're support tanks. I don't, I don't totally count them even though they're full of coral, but whatever. So I've got the reef tanks. I've got a beta tank because that's actually what it started with. I just wanted a, a little planted beta tank, which was really an excuse to get more plants. And it snowballed into, and now I have this big, actual like marine tank in here it's in my office as well um looking around this office i've got my canary he's flying around and the more i talk he thinks he that means he needs to sing louder i've got oh, you can't yeah. see it here i can kind of tip that up i've got uh, you can kind of see my red eye tree frogs are in or two of them are in that tank over behind me here is my tarantula i've got um she's a pink toe tarantula I've got my jump. No, don't worry. I'm not going to show you guys. You don't have to worry. I've got my jumping spiders, which are the cutest little fluffy. Oh, dear God, are they adorable. They're here in little vivariums. They're a little planted. Don't worry. You won't really see her, but I can show you the planted. It gives me an excuse to have plants. How cute. Like, it's little plants. I don't know if they're Aww. cute. I've got three of those on my desk. So, and there's a little jumping spider in there because if you're going to have a little vivarium, why, do, why wouldn't you want? an adorable friend to live in it. Um, plus they're super easy to take care of. So bonus there. I've got my greyhounds. So obviously they're going to be my favorites. Um, we've got the birds. Matt has a Indian ring neck, a cockatiel chicken. Chicken thinks he's mine. Um, he decided to adopt me. He was supposed to be Matt's and a parrotlet um, going around the house. Another red eye tree frog, vivarium, Lucamella dart frogs or bumblebee dart frogs, Santa Isabel dart frogs, which other room? Bearded dragon, a hognose snake. I think that's everything. I'm just kind of circling like what oh, room wow. am I circling the house? But I like my, so this is one of the things, just being a creative, I like making houses for things. I don't just want to have animals. This is not a hoarding situation. No one tried to turn me in. Um, the, I like making little enclosures and little natural habitats. So like my reef tank with the coral and I've got caves, stuff that's comfortable for the fish. Not I'm not going for what just because I wanted to have fish. I want to create the most natural, beautiful environment for them. My red eye tree frogs, they're all planted vivariums um, that the vines growing up. They're just really beautiful. So I've got these pieces. That, it's basically a box of nature shoved into, you know, the house. Even my bearded dragon, I recently made uh, and a whole enclosure for him that is supposed to look like nature, just cut out and stuck in there for him. So it gives them more enrichment. It's just a better environment for the animal all around. But I really, I ever since I was a kid, along with drawing, I was building little houses. Like I would find these little seed pods and make them a house out of construction paper. I was probably doing that at an age that was older than would be normal, but I like to make houses for things. And so it kind of started with just, I love to make things. So yeah, that is, that is part of why I have so many of these animals. I just, am like, I want to make a new vivarium. Well, something's got to live in it. So it's, it kind of snowballed. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, do you ever get like some of your, I know I've seen you, you paint your frog, your frog, I think. Um, but do you ever go like, oh, I need a but some coral in this painting. So I'm going to go over into that tank and like paint from life yes, or absolutely. take photos. Well, and it's helpful because yeah, I, I understand how coral moves. I understand how fish move. And so when you're painting an underwater scene, you can tell when someone's not really familiar with fish because all the photos you find online, the fish is like this. It's a very unnatural mm -hmm. look. When you look at actual fish, they're swimming this way and back way, it, it, which kind of violates. Usually you think I'm going to do a pet portrait. You've got to have the eye, not when it's fish. You want some facing away from you too, which isn't normal when you're doing, you know, wildlife work. So because I'm so used to seeing them and, and the, to capture that movement means you need fish going in every which direction. So whether it be the fish or understanding the movement of the coral, how it would group together. Yeah, that definitely helps. And you can even tell, I mean, even the way that I light my coral, I paint coral as they are under actinic lights, which is like a blue type of light. It makes the coral glow. That is not what they look like in nature. So you can tell that my, my marine life is really influenced by my keeping the aquarium because I'm painting how the aquarium looks, not how nature looks. Oh, that's really interesting. And you, I, I've seen some of your animals kind of like your birds flying free in your house. How many of your animals do you let just go loose and do they have free reign or is it just during certain times? My priority is keeping everybody safe. So it depends on the animal. Um, my canary is the only one who's free flight most of the time. And that is 
Well, I had to change the plants out. He's only in my office and I had to change the plants because he was trying to eat some of my other plants. So I've got plant bird safe plants, which he's not interested in eating, oddly, oddly enough. He's like, oh, I'm allowed to have this. Well, never mind then. But he does not poop when he flies at all. He lands on his cage. He goes there and he flies and he does his laps. I don't have... If the if he was leaving me little droppings everywhere, I would not have him flying loose. Like I would make a bigger Avery for him in that case. Um, I'm yeah. kind of neurotic about things being clean a lot. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, he doesn't. The only mess he really makes is sometimes the seed gets out of his cage, but not terrible. Um, and he when he takes his bath, he splatters water all over the place. But other than that, it, he's very very clean. So he, I have to make sure he's in a room where he's nowhere near paint fumes, so I can't have birds in the studio, um, the mm. office because the reef tank, like everything in here, are all my sensitive animals that are sensitive to any sort of fumes. But yeah, he doesn't. He sometimes tries to make a nest out of a basket I've got in here. He'll chew on that, but that's about the worst that he does. He's very very clean with that. Now the other parrots, they can't be loose when we're not with them because it's not safe for them. They will chew things up. So Matt, when he gets home from work, he's in there with them and they're out. All three of them are out together with him, but he also is the the referee making sure nobody picks on anybody because that mm-hmm. Indian ring neck is a bit of a bully sometimes. Um, so you, I can always tell when she's in trouble because I can hear him on the other side of the wall. What is wrong with you? So it's like, oh, she's trying to bite somebody. But um, no, they're out in the after at that point. Um, chicken, I leave out for about an hour in the morning because he's not bad about chewing wires or anything. But sushi would eat through wires, eat through everything. I mean, she's their parents are very destructive. So it's really not mm-hmm. safe for them to be loose and not be watched. So um, during the day, for the most part, they're in their cage until Matt gets home from work and then they're free with him. Uh, The greyhounds are always loose. They don't go in the bird rooms though because they have too high of a prey drive. So that would not be super safe for them. Um, Yeah, I think that's it. Most of my animals are in enclosures. I mean, the fish, the frogs, the bearded dragon, they're all in in big enclosures. The dragon does come out and walk around and just close the doors off. And I put pool noodles under all the furniture so he doesn't get up under stuff. But Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I had uh, chickens once, well, twice. They, um, I don't eat eggs or anything, but the uh, my husband and the kids wanted chickens, and I ended up taking care of the chickens. And then we had a sick chicken once, so I had him in the house in a box, you know, trying to nurse, nurse him back to health with oatmeal and yogurt. And that oh. bird was so messy; it would like it was constantly cleaning up after. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm not cut up for this. Yeah, and the I, I have a dog birds, and two cats. Parrots. They, oh, yeah. they get messy. They're so, the chicken yeah. room, I call it the chicken room. Um, it's actually Matt's game, like his computer is in there. So that's where he spends all his time. But there is bird seed everywhere. I've got a room in there. It doesn't put a dent in the, the mess those birds make. Like, it's bad. <laughs> uh, that's why I love the canaries. Perfect. Because he, he just doesn't make a big mess. He's, like I said, he, he doesn't go while he flies, which is crazy. But he, he definitely gets more freedom because of that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I saw one of your videos. I think it was one of your more recent ones. It was funny because when I when I clicked on it, you, it was about your office. And I'm like, oh, she's going to I love a good like cleaning, organizing, setting up an office video. And um, so I clicked on it because of that. But then I was I watched you. I was just entranced by your painting video. I was oh. just like and when you were like, I'm going to change. I'm like, you know, like that's so pretty. Don't you? I'm like, oh, it's even better <laughs> now. It was like I was along for the ride. It was so good. <laughs> I have to I'll have to put a link to that video in the um, show notes because it was just like you start off thinking you're watching one thing and it's like oh no there's a twist and uh, but then i seeing the bird flying it's like oh my gosh she's got the birds flying all over the house she is she is a brave woman <laughs> that bird not the rest of the birds the rest of, well I wouldn't want them getting eaten by the dogs but also yeah he he's just a little bit more spe- like he gets extra freedom because of he, his very good behavior well and it, it's a safety issue too so the, mm. yeah that painting is actually just right up here Oh yeah, that's so pretty. Um, do you? I I know um, you work a lot in colored pencil. Your paintings are so gorgeous, and I know it's such a slow medium because I tend to like I'll use colored pencil as final like touches mm-hmm. over a watercolor or over marker or something like that. Um, how do you stay focused that long to do a colored pencil painting? I think it's just that I like have an obsessive personality type. When I start a project, I obsess. Like I just everything gets tuned out. I listen to audiobooks constantly. 
Um, so I've got my story and it's like my fantasy stories, my fairies and dragons, and those are the worlds I like. Mm -hmm. So I'm listening to that and I kind of, I'm, I just, time goes by fast between the books and then just in an environment that I'm happy in and my obsessive, this is what I'm doing right now. So, and I do that about anything. I mean, I'll go through moods where I'm playing video games and I'm just obsessed. I will do this nonstop for the next 48 hours. I don't need sleep. I'm playing my game. So I think that's just a personality type for me and being so obsessive and I love detail. So colored pencils are wonderful for that. Mm -hmm. um, is it your favorite medium, would you say? No, acrylics, I think, are like my first love and will all, I can do something bigger with acrylics. There's nothing I can do with any other medium that I can't do with acrylics, whereas the reverse is not always true. Like acrylics, I just think are so versatile and I can do anything with them depending on which, you know, tools I'm using with them. And I can get something very large done very quickly. Whereas with colored pencil, if I wanted a big painting like the one I did on my office wall, with a cuttlefish, that thing, it's a 30 inch round canvas. I'm not getting that done in colored pencil this year. Like it, it's, it, you're right. It is very slow, but almost, it, I can't get enough work done if I'm only using that. So acrylics, there's definitely some, uh, that like gratification, that instant gratification of I can spend a weekend and get something huge and done. So yeah, I would say acrylics are my favorite. Colored pencils are probably right behind that. It's, it's oh, cool. Do you um, film everything you create or like the entire time or um, is everything yeah. fodder for you, YouTube channel? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, break it down I like don't a have time because I try to get a lesson out on Patreon every month or out not every month. That would not be enough. Every week. Although lately I've been doing bigger lessons. So sometimes it takes me two weeks because it's like a three hour long real time thing instead of the one hour that I normally do. But the point is I've got to get so much content up to keep up with that schedule for my Patreon students that there's no way I can make something and not record it. If I want to sketch, I need to be doing it on, I need to, I need to throw that camera on. So every, I mean, even the craft, I'm going to be doing something in gallery glass. I'm like, even that's got to be filmed. I, everything has to be a lesson. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I totally get that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Very, very rarely do I not turn the camera on. I did a large yeah. painting last weekend just for fun. Like I was scraping on acrylic paint and stuff and I didn't film it, but that's an anomaly because usually it's like How just in case, you know? Yeah. How many times did you stop to make sure the camera was still recording, even though you weren't recording just out of habit? Do you do that? I've done that where I, I went and did touch-ups and I kept checking to make sure the camera, like, there's no camera. I'm not recording right now. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. So used to it. No, but I, I, I didn't do that, but I did take my phone and I took just like kind of in the different stages, like if I was adding a new layer to it, I would just take a, like a little bit of video just cause like, Oh, I might want to use that for a short or a reel sometime. So <laughs> yeah, my brain is warped by being a YouTube yeah. content creator. <laughs> Absolutely. People have asked me how I can stand like that. The always having the camera there. It's like, you just get used to it. It's been there mm -hmm. since when did I start doing this? Like 2012, a friend of mine, I was trying to take in progress photos for my, uh, to make my website more engaging, I guess it didn't work. But he was like, why don't you film and you put them on YouTube? I didn't even know, like, that was the thing about it. He's always giving me good art advice. So I'm like, let's try it. So I started filming. And when I started getting notifications that people were subscribing, I'm like, what? Why? Why would you subscribe? I didn't even know that was a thing when I started on YouTube. Yep. Like, I so didn't know what I was doing. But, um, I, you know, you, you record for so many years. It's just normal to have this camera right here in your face as you were. Mm -hmm, absolutely. It's so funny you mentioned that because when I started YouTube, I was just looking for a free place to host video so I could put it on my blog because I was too cheap to buy the blog, the video upgrade package for WordPress. So, and I didn't know what comments and subscribers were. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it was, it's been, it's, it was funny to start so long ago before it was yeah. something people wanted to do. You know, I, I think once money got involved, then a lot more people decided that, hey, let's, uh, let's do this thing that's YouTube and social media. Yeah. Do you have a favorite project or either either painting or video that you've made? I think one of my favorites, I did an acrylic. I think all my favorites are in acrylics. I did an acrylic painting of a lion and I turned his mane and the fur on his tail into coral. And then there's fish swimming around him. He's roaring and it's a photo that I had taken. So that makes it, it's even more special when it's a photo you took. So um, the lion 
the lion I took, not all the coral and stuff. But that one, I think, is one of my favorites. It's in my living room. And I've got a couple of flamingos that I have done that just the way that, and that was another one that I took the photo. There, seriously, there's just something about it when you got to take the photo yourself. So that I would say is, I have a one flamingo one specifically that has these around them that I just love the way the light came out on that one. But it was just a lucky day at the zoo, the way the light was shining through the trees and hitting certain feathers on the bird. And he was kind of fluffed. It, the photo was just, sheer luck but i really like how that one came out so yeah two i would say those the, those two acrylic paintings and that's great because you're the only one that's going to have that photo because so, i remember oh, once yeah. i emailed you because i'm like lisa i did not mean to copy you but i use the exact same reference photo that you did in the yes. so you don't have to worry about like somebody else finding the same picture on unsplash and and then using it and you know you get to keep the specialness a little bit more yeah yeah how often do you go and do your own photography a few times a year, I'll go to the zoo and take some photos. Um, I take photos of my animals constantly. So like the one that I did, the one you were talking about with my office tour, that one, the red-eyed tree frog, I took that myself. The canary is partially a photo I took myself and partially I had to look at other photos. So that was kind of a combination. I did not take a photo of the, the cuttlefish there. But um I mean, I'm constantly taking photos of my own animals just because I, during the day, my, the main thing that slows me down from getting more work done is me constantly texting my husband, look how cute this animal is. Look how cute my spider is. Look how cute this one, look what the the dragon's doing. So um, I've got so many photos from that. So, I mean, I guess you could count with that daily, but no, I go out, like leave the hot house a few times a year. I'll go collect a whole bunch of photos. I'll just take thousands in one trip. Do you ever do plein air painting? No, because I'm a vampire and the sun is evil. So, yeah, no, I'm I'm not a, uh, I don't go outside that often. Pretty much do yard work is about it. The wind, the bugs, like I, I've done it a few times and it's, I've had fun, but I'm also like, or I could just sit in my comfy studio where all my supplies are here. I don't have to worry about that. I forgot to bring another thing of water or I'm missing this brush I wish I had right now. So I'm a little bit too, I guess, spoiled in having an art studio where everything, you know, the air conditioner is going and everything's just perfect. Dogs are laying in their bed. I, I don't have to worry about them. Get Like if I took them with me getting distracted because I saw a bird to go after, everything is just so much more comfortable in the studio. The couple of times that I've gone outside and painted, it was, I loved it. But then I just didn't do it again because, you know, it takes effort and I don't want to put that in. I think having like the such a long winter up here, I cannot wait when it's warm enough to just like hop in my convertible, put the top down, grab my paints and, you know, head for the ocean or, but I think it's because like we're, co- we're just forced inside for so long yeah. in our winters up here that you get the, you get the chance to get out. I mean, I walk the dog every day for about an hour, but, but that's all bundled up and it's not like sitting down, painting somewhere, enjoying the scene. It's sometimes just let's get out and get back as quickly as we can because it's freezing. but. It, yeah, we get so a, hot it's in funny our kind of your either, yes yeah <laughs> we get out of this heat in the sun I'm like bring on the sun I'm just thinking oh it's is it too early for me to start my self-tanning lotion <laughs> uh, when yeah, I was watching your it's so hot here I I used to when I lived in California I would go down to the beach sometimes and paint but not the winds knocking the easel over it was just always like more trouble than it was worth um I painted here once. It was in the spring, like the very beginning of the spring. So it was super cool. I went down to a, um, a, like a stream and sat there and painted. That was really fun. It was just in a little sketchbook that I really enjoyed, but like dragging out much more than that. It was actually the ink tents. That was a video I did for the ink tents travel kit. That was like, I remember this that. might actually make me want to do that. Cause that was really, that kit was really cool. Cause it was just the bare minimum you needed. I didn't have to drag. I dragged more out with the camera equipment than I did the actual painting supplies. So that I could see like just a small, small, small kit that I could enjoy. But we don't have a huge window in Texas where the weather is nice enough to be outside. We're either too hot or too cold. So mm-hmm. yeah, summers have been harsh here and we don't cool down in the night or in the evenings. Like in California, you cool down in the evenings here. We don't, we're just hot. It's still 90 degrees at midnight sometimes. So you don't like the, it, it's just, it's not ideal. And I'm a pansy yeah, that's- apparently. <laughs> No, I can see that. I can because I I'd be like I can't wait for hot weather and hot weather for me like we might hit eighty once in a while. I mean it's so it's like our summers usually oh like seventies. So it's not like 
you're you still have like a like a sweatshirt usually to throw on if you if you're a little too chilly even on the coast so um so yeah I don't think I I, I say I love hot weather but I'm not faced with like 90 degree hot weather I'm faced with like 75 oh, no, degree 90 hot weather nice so. here yeah it's the 115 <laughs> in the days that those Yikes. are the hard ones 90 I can deal with when it gets starts getting hotter I'll start getting whiny yeah, and it's hard with acrylics. If you start, you go out with acrylics, it's going to dry so quickly, and you've got much more of a setup. Even with colored pencils, you have yeah much more colored pencils than a tin of twelve watercolors. So um, yeah, yeah, that I think that would keep me inside too if I had a big like a big uh, bulky set of supplies. And I don't film when I plan air paint. I go out just for fun. I might share the photo to social media, but I rarely, um, I don't do video or anything out plein air. Very, very rarely. It's kind of just, that's kind of my hobby, I guess. Plein air painting would be my hobby where working in the studio is more of a profession or way to, yeah. make, way to make an income. Um, one thing that I've noticed, I noticed you used to do it a lot, but I actually saw you do it in your in your recent video there um, on your office tour, is airbrushing. Um, do you still do that a lot or have you switched to other mediums to get that softer effect in your work? Yeah, no, I, I still use it. It depends on what I'm doing. Um, I'm lazy and I don't clean my airbrush often enough. So usually when I want to use it, it's clogged. So I'm like, how can I get around having to use this? Because I don't want to go clean that right now because I didn't bother cleaning when I was done last time so bad but um yeah no I, I use it a lot for marine life i'll use it for blurry background so it really just depends on the project that i'm doing i i've gotten to where i depend on that fine mist sprayer so much i used to use the airbrush more to mist water to keep the acrylic paints wet now with these cheap fine mist sprayer it's not as good as with as the airbrush it is close and it's like it's so much easier so usually you'll see me using that where i used to use the airbrush to keep it wet but as far as like airbrushing actual paint, yeah, it, it, dep it just depends on the project that I'm working on. I don't find myself needing it too often for the look I'm going for, but I hadn't, I got used, I don't know if you do this, but you get so many requests for certain things. Like when I do too many surreal paintings or too many marine paintings, <clears throat> I'll start get, getting Patreon students complaining. They really want just a regular animal. Like they don't want my weird stuff. They want a tiger or a bird or, you know, something like that. So like, that's what they signed up for. So I find myself doing a lot of that, which is great because I think it, it helps refine my skills. So it's not that I don't enjoy doing that. I, I actually love doing those too. But I ended up, I realized recently, I would have just not done that much surreal work. And that's where my passion is. But I'm so focused on getting lessons out that I'm not, and not that the surreal work isn't a lesson as well, but I'm not getting enough of that. So that's one of my goals for this year is to really start getting more of the surreal stuff. So you'll start seeing more and more of the airbrushing. And I think one of the reasons that I, find myself shying away from the airbrush too much too besides being lazy and not cleaning it enough is I a lot of my students don't have an airbrush it is an expensive setup I get it I mean that's what $500 to get started with a decent airbrush so with the paint and the airbrush and the air compressor and the, all of that so I get that and I, I try to if I do something with the airbrush I try to also be like and if you don't have an airbrush this is how you're going to do it but I, I also find myself, because of the lessons, shying away from using it too much, knowing that not that many students have that setup. So I think that's probably part of why, like, I, I'm realizing I do that not, like, as I, I speak. I don't think I was even conscious that I was doing it as badly as I was until I started explaining it. I'm like, yeah, that actually makes sense. But when I start doing more surreal stuff this year, I'm hoping to get a lot of that mixed in with my normal, you know, a tiger or a bird or whatever. Um, you'll start seeing more airbrush stuff again with that. Yeah, I think that's really, um, I think that's really common when you make your living from your art, you start to having, having to um, cater what you create to your customers, your students, and then you can kind of get pulled away from the stuff you want to really do or the, the, pro the products you want to really use. And um, it's, it's hard to find that balance, but it sounds like you're really making a point to find that balance this year. We'll see if I follow through now. It's the plan, but like all New Year, I mean, not that it was a New Year's resolution, but like New Year's resolutions, we'll see how that, that pans out. Yeah, but I, I think because your stuff is so realistic, I'm sure your students can look at that that surrealist um, montage and be like, well, okay, I'm seeing how to paint a realistic fish. I'm seeing how to paint a realistic whale. I'm seeing how to paint, yeah. you know, a tiger. I don't need to put fish in it. If I don't want to, I can, you know, hopefully they, they could pick the techniques that they need on their journey from your lessons. I mean, obviously they can, because you've been on YouTube this long, you've been on teaching lessons on Patreon this long, people are, you know, they're obviously getting that value from your work, even if it's not what they would necessarily paint, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm trying to do that more in the lessons too, where like the one that I did with the whale swimming over the road, I did just the landscape. It was a complete painting because well, it was be a beautiful photo from Unsplash, but it was a complete painting on its own. So I did that as one lesson and then the whale as a separate lesson. So they can pick and choose which part. They don't have to oh, yeah. them together if they don't want to. So I'm trying oh, to find ways smart. to do that more. Or like I did a painting, uh, there was a surreal one I did of a colored pencil a year or two ago, and it was sea turtles that have roses as their shell and a bird sitting on it. So it was like, there's a separate lesson for the roses, a separate lesson for the bird that's on the arm, a separate lesson for, so hopefully that will keep more people happy with still allowing me to do more surreal stuff. Oh, that's a great idea. I would think so. Because then you're just getting more kind of it's like a very nutrient dense lesson you're getting so many instead of just it being one lesson where you paint it from soup to nuts you're getting these more focused yeah attributes you you know you're getting and then you can skip if it's not something you're interested in you could always skip and just go to the next thing that you're interested in um i'm yeah. wondering because you're so creative what's the most unusual thing you've painted on like surface wise yeah um, I had back when I used to do murals, I had a family hire me to come to their house and they had a retention wall, a, a concrete or like brick, con uh, what are they? Cinder block retention wall. And they had me paint their daughters is the tackiest cherub angels you have ever seen in your life. And they loved it because they wanted to look out their kitchen window and see this retention wall that had blue, ugly blue sky. They picked the colors and it was just you do what you're paid for sometimes, but it's, I don't have photos of that one. I kind of wish I did now, but it was, they show me the style of the cherub angel they wanted. They wanted the hair color to match their daughters and whatever. And it was, it, there's no way it was going to hold up because it's a retention wall. Water's going to come through that because it was like up and then the land here, the grass here. So that water is going to come through. And I explained it like we sealed it as well as we could, but I'm like, it's going to chip off. And so it was yeah. a very weird thing to paint knowing it's not going to last, even though they seem to think it was going to. I don't know why they thought, whatever, I warned them. Um, but yeah, that was probably the weirdest thing that I've done. I painted ceiling fans, like um, space scenes, like planets and dolphins on a ceiling fan once. Um, but that's not oh. I guess, that weird. So tables, I used to paint surreal stuff like space scenes. It was uh, I went through a, a phase where everything was space with dolphins or whales swimming through. So I did that on quite a few pieces of furniture back in the early 2000s, the late 90s. Um, yeah, that retention wall was probably the most bizarre though to me because it was like, what? first, I don't know why you want it. Second, why would you pay for it knowing it's not going to hold up? But okay, if that's what you want, I don't do murals anymore. So, um, I don't miss those days. Well, you mentioned things holding up and something that I've heard you speak a lot about is archivability and light fastness in art. Why do you think it's important to touch on these subjects? I think it's important because one, buyers do not understand that concept. They see something they like and they want to buy it. And I respect that. However, they also don't realize that they may have spent $5,000 on a painting and in 10 years, those colors don't look like what they thought that they, people think. And I, I think this comes from like, we see stuff from the old masters or we see work that was restored. That's, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. And they assume that all paintings last like that. And they don't, depending on the materials we use, those colors within a few years are nearly translucent. They're not that bright, vivid color that they wanted. And I don't think it's fair to be selling to them. And yeah, we can educate the buyer. They're not going to understand. It's going to go in one ear and out the other. They don't get it. So I think we as artists need to be responsible in creating something that is going to last for the buyer, that is going to last long term. I, it's, it feels very slimy to me to sell work that we know is not going to last when the buyer doesn't understand that concept. Like even with me, ink tents, some ink tents are, and you guys, I mean, I did the, the artwork on the ink tents 10. I love working with ink tents, but mainly I sell prints of it because not all of the colors are light fast. Some are, some aren't. The only ink tents that I sell is if it's one of my followers who completely understands the concept of, I'm warning you, it's ink tents. It, you know, put it behind UV glass. It'll be last longer, but also you, you know what you're buying, getting going in. But like the average buyer, I wouldn't take it to like an art show and sell it to an average person who doesn't understand that concept because it just feels slimy to me. And I know some artists don't care, but if understanding the buyer's point of view of, 
well, that they don't understand, that they trust that what they're buying from us should last a long time, that they're excited about that. Um, I just feel that it's important for artists to be aware of that. And we want our work to last long term anyway. I, I think that that's a big deal. It's very disappointing when something gets ruined that we've created. So why not use supplies that are going to last long term, but especially if you are selling it? I mean, if you're not going to use light fast supplies, you can always make prints and sell those safely. But to sell the original to somebody who doesn't understand that all those pinks and purples are not going to be pink or purple in 10 years is, it just feels dirty to me. Yeah, I totally understand that. I'm I'm often surprised at how many artists don't know, don't care, don't care to investigate. They think if I'm buying this tube of paint from my art supply store, then they've protected me. I've like, they just trust yeah. that anything they buy from Blick is going to be light fast. And I saw an artist using, and it's actually paper I use when I did children's classes, like the, the Blick sulfite drawing paper, but it's, that's not, that's not acid free. And this artist was doing uh, a lot of explorative works, but they were selling it and, and the prices were, you know, a couple hundred bucks. So it's not like, you know, you're selling it for $5 on, you know, the street corner or something like that. You know, you're selling it for a couple hundred dollars and that's a lot of money for people, uh, for most people, I would think. But yeah. I mean, I don't think they were intentionally like saying like, oh, I'm going to buy this cheap paper and then like rip somebody off. I don't think they were thinking that whatsoever. I think they're like, oh, this is an affordable paper. I can explore. I can experiment. Then I can, you know, and I can sell it. Uh, but but I mean, it's it even says like this is not acid free paper. I'm pretty sure it says that on the on the Blick website. But I just found that to be uh, a little unnerving that a professional artist wouldn't realize that. But the more I talk to professional artists in like, say, if I go to a, a paint out on a plein air painting day or something, other artists being like, I don't know what pigments in that, or I don't know, you're just not even like registering mm -hmm. that it could fade. Just like, yeah, I like, I like to use this. I like to use a Rulian yellow, but a Rulian, like the traditional Rulian yellow in watercolor could brown like for, for in a fairly short time and alizarin crimson can fade in like a month. But they're like, oh, this is the colors that my teacher taught me how to use. So I'm still, I just use these because that's what I've always used. And uh, there's so many more options that are, that are going to last a lot longer, but it's, and it's not malicious. It's just, they have, they don't, they care about making the art, but not about any of the science or any of the uh, longevity of it. It just doesn't occur to it. them. I didn't know either when I started. Luckily, what I started with just happened to be all, all archival because I, I was focused on acrylics or graphite. I mean, I was safe. The, the paper I knew needed to be acid free. That was the extent of my knowledge. I didn't understand. And I wasn't selling colored pencil work back then. But like I was using Prismacolor. Well, half a Prismacolor. I don't remember the actual statistics. So don't, don't get mad at me. But not you, but <laughs> anybody watching. Um, but a large portion of Prismacolors are not light fast. And I didn't know that. Now, luckily, I wasn't selling my work back then. But that could have been an issue. Um, but the acrylics that I was using were safe. The canvases I was using were safe. So I didn't have any issues with that. One of the things I think that made me really aware of this as being a problem, when I first started oil painting, so back in the late, somewhere in the 90s, um, I started oil painting and I'm using linseed oil. And I thought, well, I can get linseed oil from the hardware store for way cheaper than the art supply store. So I went and bought a big can of this. And I think I'm so smart. I'm saving all this money. I painted a bunch of stuff. So now let's jump forward. So no, this would have been in 2000 because it was an art show. I think I sold stuff in 2000. I went to Catalina Island, had an art show. I did a bunch of little like 8 by 10, 11 by 14 inch. Um, so, and they weren't selling for a lot. I was selling them for like $50 or $75. So they were not going for a lot, but they were oil paintings of like a, a single whale or whatever. And about six months after that show, I had one of those paintings hanging on my own wall. And I start seeing the yellow buck like coming out. It's almost like it was leaching away from the canvas and it looked like big drips. Like it was odd. I would have never, yellowing, I'd almost looking back, understand more. I don't even know how those drips started separating from the painting. It like mm. was coming, it was weird. But I'm like, I sold paintings using those materials to this day. So we're talking 25 years later or almost, I still feel horribly guilty. And they were $50, $75 paintings, but it doesn't matter. I feel so guilty because I sold something because I didn't do my research. Now, back then we didn't have the internet. It was a lot harder for me to find any of that. I mean, we had the internet, but not, not the internet of today. Hmm. So I yeah. just did not know. I did not understand what a difference these archival, like what that meant. And I feel so guilty. And so I think that's part of why I'm so passionate about like use archival materials. You don't want that on your conscience knowing, or maybe you do because you, you don't care about screwing people over. I do. And I feel horrible about it. And so that's why I, like, 
definitely a huge plays a huge part on why I'm so worried about everything being high quality if you're going to sell it. Now those paintings, if I just gave it away as a gift, who cares? If I'm doing it for practice, who cares? But when you when you start selling, it's like you just need to be at a a, a better standard so that you don't do what I did. Mm -hmm. I work in a sketchbook a lot and I, I don't worry about anything that I put in a sketchbook. I happen to really enjoy using alcohol markers and they will fade mm -hmm. so quickly if you put them out in light. But I just yeah. it, I enjoy the um, the spontaneity of them and just working in a sketchbook. And I don't typically sell my artwork, so um, I'm not too worried about it. But occasionally someone will be like, it'll be something I did for Inktober and somebody will want like the physical original artwork and it's not in a sketchbook and I'm like you gotta know it is going to fade if you hang it up you need to like keep it like in a book or something like hidden away and just look at it once in a while because or just know that it's gonna fade but yeah, yeah it's um I don't I don't get I like knowing what's archival and not mostly because I love to paint my like pictures of my children sometimes and if I'm gonna paint a portrait of one of my kids I just want to make sure that if I hang it up, it's not going to fade, but um, I'm not too interested in selling my work. So I don't, I don't worry about it too much, but if it, yeah, only, only if I know it's something I think might end up getting hung up or I might want to sell an original of, but it's good yeah. to know, I think. Um, oh, well, my goodness. We're just jabbing. I forgot my next question. Um, so what are you working on now? Do you have uh, projects that are in the works that you're excited about? I'm actually working on my studio right now. So I recently went through and painted all the walls. I did a kind of mixture of a dark gray, a teal, and then a lighter teal. So I've got a little depth there. I painted those. Everything hurts. Oh my gosh, I'm too old for this now. But everything hurts. So I, the main reason I don't do murals anymore. But I'm doing gallery glass for my windows. I want all of the windows, the bay windows in there to look like stained glass. I don't, I mean, I live in Texas. I love Texas, but we don't have the prettiest views out of our windows. I see everyone else's same roof as mine. Like it's just, and it's a new area. So we don't even have that many trees. It, it's, I want to feel, I want to feel like I'm in another world when I go into my studio and paint. So that's what I'm most excited about. I'm trying to recreate that in the studio, get this sort of like fairy wizard looking like, um, anyway, I, I, I'm weird. I get it. Right now you walk in there and you're like, oh, this is the master bedroom of your house. I mean, there's no bed in there. It's, that's what I made into the studio. But I, I don't want it to feel like a master bedroom in a house in Texas. I want you to feel like when you walk in there, you just entered a whole new world. So that's what I'm trying to create right now. I mean, it's beneficial because when I film my videos, I can film it that in there, you know, more of the studio that has a pretty background. But yeah, that's what I'm most excited about. The problem is those windows are 58 inches tall by 33 ish 34 wide that's a lot of gallery glass so i just made the fit frame for the first one yesterday and it's a little bit flimsy and i'm like oh maybe i should have done this in two pieces i'm questioning my life choices right now but i'm starting i'm working on that project so i know it's not my normal fine art stuff but i'm so excited about this project like redoing that whole studio that even like, I mean, when I live streamed on Wednesday night, just having the walls painted, the, the whole feel in that room was so much more enjoyable for me to be in. And so I'm more excited to create when I create an atmosphere that I want to be in that feels like artsy and comfy and not just a cold, sterile room that it was feeling like before. Do you think the um, the gallery glass will affect the light quality in your room? Like, do you do you rely on natural light at all? I don't because I work at night. I hate working in the day, but I do rarely use that, you know, every once in a while I need to do something in the day. I'm running out of time or whatever. So I, um, cause I thought about that. I was going to originally do these, the gallery glass directly to the walls because it peels off or not the wall, the, the windows, it peels off. No big deal. Two problems with that. One, the tech, it's a South facing window. I'm pretty sure those are going to bleach out quick there. So I want to be able to put a UV protecting glass on the back of it, which you don't do on app. It would just be weird to put that on and then gallery glass over that. So I ended up making these frames that can pop in and out of the window. So if I don't want the stained glass look, I just they just come right out. Um, the only thing is they're so big, they're a little bit flimsy. So I'm working on acrylic sheets, like big plastic sheets that are mounted onto that frame. So that's where the gallery glass will be. And then on the backside of that, I can put a UV protecting film to try to help them not to fade too fast. So that is the plan. Whether or not this works, I don't know. I'll, I'll be recording it. So there will be a video letting people know if I failed this, this plan or not. But yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about 
the changes I'm making in there. So yeah, hopefully I'll still be able to like the plants because I've got a lot of plants and I'm going to put grow lights in there. But at least a few days of the week, I'd like to remove a few of those gallery glass panels and let real light come in and, and get some supplemental light for those plants. So that was the theory, two of the theories behind doing removable gallery glass windows that just fit in each of the frames versus going directly on the window. Plus, if I do it separately, I'm able to work flat so I can use the liquid lead instead of the leading strips. Those lead strips don't bend real well, so it's hard to get details. And they're they're so expensive, like horribly expensive compared to the, the liquid lead. The liquid lead looks more natural to me. So that was one more bonus of, of not doing it directly on the window. So I think I think hopefully, hopefully it'll end well without having too many issues when I do need natural light. Yeah, and I think that if you're working on like plexiglass or acrylic sheeting, that that might provide a little bit more protection than a regular glass glass will work will anyway. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm really not sure on that. So I'm gonna buy Amazon sells like UV film, or they say it is. Whether or not they're, <laughs> for all I know, it's just some expensive film that is not actually UV protecting. But I want to put that on the back side of these. So yeah. um, hopefully, and they have some that's reflective too. I don't know if I'd like that better or not, but. It may help keep some of the heat out in the summer as well. So there's an added bonus there if I do put that that type on. Oh, probably. And just for the viewers that don't know what ga gallery glass is, could you explain that process and that product a little bit? So, yeah, there are these little tubes. They come, they're about this big. And it's one of those prod products that you could be six years old, you could be 50 years old. It's all going to look the same. Like, it does not take much in the way of skill besides coming up with your design. But it's um, a way to paint something that looks like stained glass. When someone walks in the room, they're going to think I have real stained glass until they get up close to it. When I mean, it's obvious when you're up close that it's not real. But it really, when you're at a distance, it takes people a second to go up and look and realize that's not real stained glass. It, it gives such a cool effect. But it's a paint that you paint on. It's trans It goes on opaque. It dries translucent. It's kind of like Elmer's glue. It kind of smells like that. But it's... Um, They've got tons and tons of different colors and you just squeeze. You don't even use paintbrushes. You just squeeze it right out of the tube. I just mix with the tip of the tube. I rarely use any mixing bowls. You can get mixing bowls to, to use, but they're rarely needed. Um, like uh, you can mix with a, a shish kebab stick for the cooking. Is that what they're called? I don't know. I don't cook. I'm making things up. Yeah, those. <laughs> you can mix with those. You can, you can use just about anything, but they're very, it's very, very easy. Um, to get the look of stained glass, it's fairly, well, the price actually just doubled. Um, they told the, the, when I went to buy mine, I was surprised at some of the prices because they had both price tags on them. But um, they told me it was for inflation. Like, but they doubled, whatever. That's a whole other wow. round. But um, I mean, compared to having a real stained glass window done, this is a much cheaper option and it peels off. So when you don't want it anymore, you can just peel it off the window. It'll stay there as long as you want. It doesn't fall off. You can peel it off when you don't want. I've also done it around, um, if you have like, because I have builder grade mirrors, I've done around the, um, in my apartment too, because it's not permanent, it just peels off, the a border. So it looked like stained glass around my bathroom mirrors. And it just gives a really pretty look without doing anything permanent you know you you remove it when you're bored with it so there's a few different ways you can apply it whether you 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 can do it on a flat like a a sheet of plastic and then peel it off and stick it on the window or for me I'm doing I'm going to leave it on the plastic that I'm working on you could do it directly onto glass like it's it's really versatile the, the ways that you can use it um but yeah it's fun it's it's not like a fine art it's more of a craft but it is a fun craft and it's something that looks mm -hmm. it like I said I can work with a six-year-old. I used to teach this, um, but or that classes with gallery glass. I could work with a six-year-old. I could work with a fifty-year-old. They're going to look the same. You're really not going to see a difference. Whereas, like painting, it's obvious if somebody is more skilled with this. This one, your first time through, looks great um, with no experience. So it's a really, really fun, fun thing to work with. So you draw your design with the letting, the liquid letting, and let that dry, and then just fill it in with the mm -hmm. um, the colored. Yeah, so I came up with a design. Um, I drew it. Well, I drew mine on my my Wacom tablet. But you can just get a big piece of paper, draw out your design, all your little lines you want. You put that under the project you're working on, or if you're working on a glass, like on a window, you would put it on the backside of the glass. And then in my case, because I'm working flat, I'll take the liquid lead and I just kind of draw it on, kind of like cake decorating, you know, where you're squeezing mm -hmm. and it just kind of falls into place. Um, kind of. That can you tell I don't make cakes because that is not how that happens. <laughs> but um, it, it's kind of like that. Kind of, not really. But you then let it dry, like 
few hours to overnight and then you just fill it in with the colors where you want and those colors dry clear or you know they're tinted with the color but they it looks like stained glass it, you can mix two colors together so you get some streaking in there to get some some interesting looking glass but yeah, yeah. it's it's pretty cool that's neat. I didn't realize you could do it like directly on a vertical surface. I thought it would just mm -hmm. run everywhere. It does. You have to do it in a lighter layer. So you're not going to put it on a stick or you can do it in two layers. I've done that as well. Um, I used to teach this back years ago um, at Michael's in California and we had a big classroom back then they had really neat classrooms, but the window went across the whole front and I did a whole arch and it said, did it say classroom classes? I don't know. I wrote something on it, but it made it look like stained glass. But I was upright. And so you just have to make sure you don't put it on too thick because it will start to run. You just take your finger when it hits the like the lead, it starts to run. It'll hit the block wherever you've done the lead. And you just kind of wipe it off with your finger if it did get too heavy. But putting it on in lighter layers and two layers if you need it to be more opaque, let the one dry and then go on top of it again is how you would do that. So it's certainly easier flat, but I've definitely done big projects on upright windows as well. Oh, that's really interesting. Now I want to like, I want to do some gallery glass in my house. That just sounds really fun. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, so is there any, is there any topics or anything you would like to talk about on the podcast today? I, we both talk so fast that I feel like I've burned through all my questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that I like, I'm so determined to convince people of is Try things that are harder than what you feel your skill level is. I feel like everyone gets in their own way of improving. So they want to get into fine art and they see work that someone else has done and they think, I will never be that good. That, that, that it's something they're born with. That I wasn't born with it, so mine's not going to be as good as theirs. And they just accept forever looking, you know, creating beginner art. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you like the beginner style art, like paint and sip stuff, that stuff's fun. Nothing wrong with that. I like doing that stuff sometimes. So... I don't take that as me like bashing beginner art, but so many artists want to go further, but they feel like they're, they, they keep following beginner lessons, whether it be my beginner lessons or someone else, they just, they're like, I'm a beginner. So I need to do these beginner lessons unless they are willing to jump into the more difficult things, the more advanced projects, they are never going to progress past being a, a beginner. If you want to forever be a beginner, always follow the beginner lessons. And it's not, again, I'm not bashing any teachers because I teach beginner stuff. Don't follow all of my beginner stuff. Get into some of the stuff that you look at and you're like, oh, that's too hard. That, that, that's too hard for me. That's what you should be painting. Those are the, the projects that are going to push you forward. Uh, think of it like if you wanted to learn a new, new language and that teacher was only speaking baby talk to you. Yeah, people will kind of understand what you're saying, but you're not you're not really learning the language. If you want to learn the language, you got to jump into the hard words. You've got to learn to pronounce things properly. And so I want to encourage people, don't just follow my beginner tutorials or somebody else's beginner tutorials. Follow the things that are too difficult for you that you look at and you're like, I'm never going to be able to do that because we're not born with it. None of us are. This is not, I know it's controversial because it's always beginners who think this, that it's something you're born with. It is not. It is a skill you learn and develop. And I don't know what it is about art, but so many people think that it, you're born with it. Okay, why? only why is art the only career people do that with a doctor somebody feels called to be a doctor they feel like this is this is my calling in life i want to heal people they don't run around the neighborhood slapping band-aids on people they go to to school. Now, I'm not saying you need to go to school to be an artist, but you do need to learn the skill, learn the technique. You can learn it online. You can learn it through books. You can learn it through trial and error like I did. It takes a lot longer that way, by the way. You can learn through videos. You can find a local teacher. You can find someone to teach you the skills, but find somebody who is way more advanced than, you know, that is creating the work that you look at and you're like, that is my end goal. That's what I want my work to look like. That's who you, that's the work that you want to follow. It's not something we're born with. If you could see my original paintings and drawings, you're God. Like, you would never think it was the same artist. I wasn't born with it. I wasn't abnormally gifted. I was sick a lot as a child, and so I drew more than the average child. That's the only reason I was slightly above average. You know, once I got into my teenagers, I was drawing better than my friends did. Because I was too sick to out ride my bike all the time, I was drawing a lot. It's only from experience. No matter what skill level you're at right now, if you want to become amazing, you want to be doing really realistic work, if that is your goal, you can do it. But you've got to jump into these harder lessons, harder tutorials. And I think one of the things that happens is people will follow, let's say you follow one of my beginner tutorials, and you follow along and it looks great. It looks just like mine. Well, yeah, because it's a beginner tutorial. So now you follow one of my more advanced tutorials. You think, oh, it doesn't look anything like yours this time. So I must not be ready for that. I'm going to go back to the beginner stuff. 
that's how you get there. You follow the stuff that at first it's going to feel like I'm bad at this. That's normal. But that is how you're going to learn. Jump into some of these more advanced projects if you really want to improve your skill in painting and drawing. Don't dismiss it as I'm just not good. I'm not born with it. It, it it's, it's a developed skill like any other profession. It's something that you're going to put time into and study and learn. But you absolutely can do it. And at any age, too. I have known of people who started, they retired, and then got into art. And they were phenomenal. Never picked up a paintbrush before. They just decided, hey, I've got some free time. I'm going to start. So you can start this at any time. But you've got to follow lessons that feel too difficult for you if you really want to improve. Oh, I agree. And I think that like when uh, artists start suffering burnout, I know when I start suffering burnout, it's because maybe I've been like really time strapped. So I'm not stretching myself to do anything harder. I'm like, no, I got to do something that I know is going to be a product that is going to come out. Okay. I can't take any risks. And um, I think people get bored with their hobby because they're doing beginner lesson, beginner lesson, beginning beginner lesson. And they start to lose that because you stop having those like, um, those level up situations yeah. and you just kind of stay at that same level and you get burned out, you get tired of it, you get sick of it. You're like, I'm not getting any better. And then you give up, but you just need to kind of um, challenge yourself and try something mm -hmm. harder or try doing it more. Because the thing I noticed is when you're a beginner and you probably see it all the time on your YouTube channel and in your classes that you get people come in, they're so excited. And, but then they kind of peter off after a while. And, um, you know, the beginners, you come in, you make so many big jumps, like you pick up your paintbrush and you make your first painting. That's a huge jump because yesterday you couldn't paint anything. And then today you painted something and then you try something else, another big jump. But, but then those steps get less steep. The, the more you do it, you don't have those huge breakthroughs. Um, and then if you don't challenge yourself because you just want to have that pretty picture when you're done, you end up just getting burnt out and not growing at all. Yeah. And I think, too, I see this so many, much in beginner art groups. They expect to finish an entire painting in an evening. You can, but it's going to look like crap. I mean, be, be realistic about that. Know that the more time you put into it, this is going to make a difference. And again, don't, when you're sticking with beginner lessons, it doesn't matter how much time you put into a beginner lesson. It is only going to get, get you so far. Get into that advanced stuff. But I'll realize that if you put... If you got these results, when you put an hour into it, imagine if you put eight hours into it. Imagine if you put 20 hours into it. So I think people ha have an unrealist, and I, I kind of blame YouTube for this. So we all do time-lapse videos. And we look at that thing and, oh my gosh, they got that done. That's a two-minute video. I could get this done in a day. Yeah, that was three weeks worth of work for me. So oh. to understand the amount of time, the patience, the, the tediousness, and be willing to make ugly paintings. When you get started, you're going to paint some ugly things. And that is a part of the process. Don't be mad at yourself. Be proud of that. That's just one step. You just took a step forward. Even if it was an ugly step, it was a step forward towards that end goal. But the students I find that are not willing to make mistakes, they don't progress as fast. The students who jump in and they're like, well, I'm going to slap some paint on there and I'm going to learn what I can learn and then I'm going to move on. They will learn faster because they're willing to make that mistake without being afraid, but also slow down. Make sure you got that accurate drawing. Make sure, you know, get get your foundation in there. And I think that there's so many good lessons that can walk you through the, the order of things. Like let's use a, a, a acrylic painting, for example. When I first started painting, my idea was that you would draw, let's say I'm gonna do a dolphin. I'm gonna draw out the dolphin. I'm gonna paint the water around it. Well, now my paint, my water around it isn't smooth. Why isn't it smooth? You can see all these brush strokes. With acrylic paints, it's actually better to paint the whole background and layer up layer the paint forward so you're painting the, the entire background like the dolphin's not even there and then draw the dolphin in. you know there's an order that we can do things to make things more easy and I, these lessons will help you do that in a way that I certainly didn't have that back you know in the 90s when I, I first start, got my hands on acrylics for the first time so there are so many resources out there but also don't be fooled by the time lapse thinking I'm going to get this done in, in, a, in an evening I chances are that painting took that artist depending on what it was weeks so, you know, slow down and don't be frustrated by the ugly stages. That is normal. That is a part of the process. And even in, an, in, an, in I can talk, in an individual painting, you're going to have ugly stages. Even if you're very skilled. I mean, I go through so many ugly stages in my work. It's an ugly layer. It's fine. It's not done yet. That's a part yeah. of the process. So I think people get discouraged about things that they shouldn't be discouraged about. I'm also seeing a lot of people focusing on things that aren't that important. Color. Oh my gosh, the amount of times that I see people hung up on, I just, if I knew the right color, 
then mine would look realistic too. It's not the color, it's the value. When you hear yourself think, if I just knew the right color, you know you're focused on the wrong thing right now. The values, mm -hmm. dark darkness, light light, that's what's gonna make the difference in your work and make it look realistic. The right color, you just, congratulations, you've got a cartoon, good cartoon. So, you know, <laughs> those are some of the, the hangups I think that slow people down that I would really like to see like anyone can progress. It's not a, you're born with it. Anyone can progress. So I, I always feel bad when I see someone getting hung up on, on some of these challenges that are normal. Everyone goes through these challenges. Just don't stay, don't, don't get stuck on them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, I call it the hot mess stage when like the painting looks like, Ooh, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's not looking good. <laughs> so I painted um, it with my feet stage. Yeah, yeah. I think that a lot of times people get intimidated when they see uh, a beautiful painting, like a YouTube tutorial for a beautiful painting that they think is above their level. So they don't even click on it. And they look for, yeah. okay, where's the easy thing that I can paint in half an hour? And they'll click on the half an hour thing, even though that's a time lapse. But in their mind, it seems that's attainable. That's reachable. It's not really what I want to paint, but I can do it. Um, mm -hmm. So I think your advice for for stretching and reaching and trying to to do those harder things, watch a longer tutorial. I mean, it's going to be worth it. It probably still yeah. might be time lapsed. You know, if you see an hour and a half tutorial, it still might have been a you know a two week painting. And or um, even if it's you know, not, I mean, it. I'll do my live streams, and they may be an hour to an hour and a half for the lesson portion, and it's not time lapsed. But I paint abnormally fast. I paint as fast as I talk. Don't expect yours to go that fast. Even then, I mean, I've got a lifetime of experience behind me, and that's part of why I'm, I'm painting as fast as I do. Pause the video, take your time, whatever time you need, take your time. Painting faster doesn't mean you're better. It just, you know, it, it's not really an element of how good you are. It just is what it is. Me talking faster doesn't mean I communicate better. It actually kind of does the opposite because half, half of you probably, well, no, your viewers are used to you, so they're used to fast talking, but I mean, Painting faster doesn't mean you're better or lesser than at all. It, ha it, it plays no role in, in you being a good artist. So yeah, trying to, you know, pause the video, take your time, get it to look, whatever. If you're following a tutorial, pause it at that stage and don't move on until yours looks like that stage. I see too often people are jumping into stage seven where they should still be on stage two. Like you're not even ready for, for seven yet. You're, you're back here. Pause the video, get caught up. So yours looks just like that, whatever lesson you're following before you move on to the next next that pause button is amazing use it yeah it's actually an advantage to online learning versus in-person learning because you can take you can make your instructor go exactly the pace that you need to go mm -hmm. when when you do your live streams do you complete a painting during that live stream or are you doing like um like this week we're going to do the first third of the painting and then the next week we're going to finish it up or the, the second third or how, how do you structure your live streams yeah. That is how I used to do it. And about a year ago, I changed it and decided I, whatever project I'm doing is done in that lesson. So an hour to an hour and a half is how long I want to get that done. And then the last 30 hour to 30 minutes, I answer questions. But um, yeah, it's a full start to finish project and they're beginner projects. So it's not going to be your advanced stuff. They're fun. So with the beginner stuff, either do it as you do a few beginner stuff before you jump into the advanced stuff or do it just for a fun little break in between your big stuff. But yeah, it's, it's always beginner lesson because I have to have it done in an hour to an hour and a half. So it's nothing super advanced. We're focused more on our values, getting the lights and darks in there than tons of detail. But so they're really good lessons for that. But yeah, it's the full thing start to finish. Um, I found that that worked better when I was doing them as uh, like part one, part two. I mean, some of those went to part seven or eight. I mean, some of those I was dragging out for a really long, like really advanced stuff. And that people aren't going to be there every week and they're definitely not following along because you can't just jump in one week and, and, and paint with me because you, you're you behind all those weeks. So while those were more detailed, I just I decided to start doing where it was just a complete one beginner lesson. And so those are my beginners. And then my advanced stuff would be the Patreon stuff or any edited videos. Do you think people paint along with your live stream or do you think they they watch to hang out in the chat and, and visit with other friends that they've met in your community oh. and then paint it later once they've once their the live stream is done? Yeah, all of those. So some people are painting as I'm going. Some people are painting later and then some are just in chat talking about art, talking, you know, because it's oh, it's generally the same group of people. So everyone kind of gets to know each other, which is fun. 
Yeah, I think it's fun to to uh, think about when you're doing a live stream. I don't do them as often as you do, but for all the people that are active and chatting, I mean, you can see how many people are watching. There must be a bunch of people that are just silently watching and painting along, or maybe you're just company in the background while they're they're going about their day or working on some. Some people are like I'm working on something completely different, but you know, it's yeah, nice to yeah. have company in the studio. <laughs> yeah, that, that's fun. definitely a lot of people working on their own projects. Yeah. I wish YouTube would put the live streams and the videos under the same tab because when I go to look at somebody's channel, I want to see everything that they're doing. I want to see all their videos, maybe not the shorts, but all the videos. And I have to remember, get to click on the live stream tab yeah. to see where the live streams are now. So that's kind of, um, uh, I wonder if, if the replays on live streams get forgotten about because they're under a, a new tab now. I tried, um, I spent the better part of last year, I would take my live stream the next day and edit it out. So any pauses, I'm sharpening my pencil, I'm washing my brushes, I would edit all of that out. So it was just, you know, straight lesson. Um, all of like, cause my dogs get super chats. If someone gives a super chat, my, my greyhounds get a treat. So like I would edit Aww. those out. So it was just the straight lesson. And it, you know, it takes me a couple of hours to edit that. And I was not finding though, that those videos would, you know, if it was back in 2013, those videos would have taken off cause it's a full lesson, not anymore. But, um, yeah, I didn't find that it, I was getting extra views from doing that versus just if people want to watch a replay, they can just watch the live stream. Um, so I stopped editing them. I don't know if I'll go back to it, but I mean, two hours a week of just editing that. So I had both the live stream mm -hmm. up and that. And I, I wasn't seeing a huge difference numbers wise, like the ones that were edited down. So it was just under videos. They were not getting more views than the live streams themselves were. So it was like, well, why am I doing this then? Yeah, so the I don't juice know. is not I, worth the squeeze. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And then I think if you edit them, if you edit the live stream, I think it makes the chat disappear too. And I think a lot of people enjoy yeah. looking back at the live chat to see what people were talking about during the, um, during the stream, especially if they know the community and they weren't able to, to be there, they can see kind of like, you know, catch the conversation the next day. And I think that yeah. helps build community well, when you can keep that. And I changed it though. So I don't answer questions or chat during, I used to chat with people while I was working because when I started the, the original live streams, when I first started doing that, it was whatever I'm working on, like my big project, I'll just let you hang out with me for a couple hours while I'm working and we'll chat while I work. It wasn't ever intended to be a straight lesson, but then people would complain that they wanted, like, I'm not learning, just paint, shut up and paint. God, I heard that so much. Shut up and paint. Oh, um, cause you I know, people that. I hear that too, girl. I know. Oh, I know. that made me mad. <laughs> but I'm like, wait, on edited videos, I don't know how you want me to teach you if I'm not allowed to talk. Like I, I have not yeah. mastered, um, the art of telepathy. So, um, yeah, <laughs> no, that's not going to work for me. But um, also you're blocked now for being a jerk, but okay. So, but yeah, no, I did have a lot of people who really wanted just the art thing. So I started doing more lessons instead of my big project that I was working on, but I was still chatting with everyone as I painted. But there's so many pauses because I'm gonna stop and answer a question and people were complaining, well, you're just answering the same question week after week. I, okay, so now <laughs> I, I keep trying to refine it into more of what people want. So now it's just a beginner lesson start to finish finish and I do the only questions I answer or reply to people during the stream is if it's related to the actual project that I'm working on I'm really lucky um, one of my moderators Nick um you I'm sure you know him he's here on YouTube Nick Edgar um he or I, some people watching would know but he has um he I, my brain just completely shut off like gone it ended, we're done. But no, he will take questions and send them to me on Discord. So if there's a question I missed that I need to answer during the stream, and it keeps it from me not being distracted, like I just was looking at the chat and then trying to pay attention to this, he just sends me a message if it's anything I need to be paying attention to. And then he saves all the questions throughout the entire live stream and sends them off to me at the end. So after the art, the lesson is done, now I'll, now we have our chat. So the chat really isn't until the end anyway. So editing down the lesson wasn't really removing much in the way that people, like it, it wasn't related to the lesson. That is a lot of information no one cares about. I don't know why I rambled about that for so long. You're welcome. Oh, no, I'm sure people, especially if they're YouTube creators or thinking about being YouTube creators, will enjoy that. I What I do is I, because um, I've always heard people complaining about, like, people saying hello to people coming in and, you know, like, people spend so much time just saying hello to everybody. So I made a conscious effort when I do a live stream not to do that, but I take 
I'll take a break and I'll be like, I'll be taking your questions in about 10 minutes. So type the word question in all caps and then I'll go through them. So that way somebody watching the replay can just jump right ahead till they see yeah. the, the paintbrush moving again. Because uh, yeah, I can get that. But I also want it to to be useful to as many people as possible. Um, and I know a lot of people will just ask, will ask questions because they want to hear their name kind of set out on a video. And I get that. I mean, it's fun to, you know, to yeah. be part of the community, kind of like when you're a kid, a teenager, you call the radio station for a <laughs> like a request and, oh, they say your name and they play your song. And that's probably why I got to radio when I as a career before I got into uh, to art. But uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's good because it's great for community and you want people to feel like they belong and you mm -hmm. want people to, you know, because that's going to encourage them to actually pick up the paintbrush if they think somebody else is holding them accountable. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I I experimented with taking the live streams back when I was doing them every week and then um, downloading them and then time lapsing them. But I didn't find that it, I found that it split the views between the the live stream and the pre-recorded yeah. it didn't really which kind of ding the channel overall because if you had lower at that time i don't know who knows what what helps <laughs> and what hinders your growth nowadays but back then if you had a poor performing video then it would was less likely to remote uh, re recommend your next video at least that was the lore or yeah. the myth. i don't know yeah i, I don't even know if anybody still. knows you well, they say still? now that the videos are standalone, so they perform on the one. But if you can get this one, if you can keep people longer watching your other content, they're more likely to see your future content. Or I, I don't It's all confusing. It really is, because I feel like, I mean, I've been on since 2010, and I've always, once I started, I was putting content out fairly regularly. And for a few years there, I had daily content. And I, I never knew what was going to do well. And I'd have something that I thought was just, well, this is too easy. It was like a sunset with three colors, like painted on a, like a Strathmore green watercolor greeting card, like 10 minute video, that thing blows up. And then like something I really put a lot of time and effort into it's crickets, you know? So it's, I, I've never been able to guess. So it's kind of like, well, I'm just going to try whatever I want to try and throw it out yep. there and we'll see what happens because Honestly, I still don't know any better than I did back in March of 2010 when I started, I swear. Yeah, I've been working with a YouTube coach and um, a video IQ YouTube coach, which I love, by the way. Um, so if anyone's considering, oh, my gosh, I am. At, at first, I was kind of like, uh, this is a little too beginner. They're going over beginner. Like, I've been doing YouTube for so long. I don't think this is for me. After a few weeks and we got through all the beginner stuff where he knew I like I, I know this stuff. Oh my gosh, it's been so helpful. But even then, I don't, it's helpful, but I still don't know what's going to do well. Like I, I'm still always surprised. I'm like, I don't know why that one's, why, why is that performing? And the one I put all the work into is like, nah, I don't know. Yeah, it's so hard to tell. Sometimes I'll look at like, I'll see a channel that I think is doing some really cool stuff and I'll be like, and I'll, I'll look them up on Social Blade, which is a website where you can put in any YouTube creator's name and it'll show you like their subscriber count and their growth and how many subscribers and views they get per month. So you can basically cyber stock any, you know, competition <laughs> on YouTube that you want to. But I'll be curious. because I'll be like, man, they just took off. I wonder what they were doing. And um, I'll try to figure out, did they you know, blow up on Facebook? Did they blow up on Instagram? Did they, are they, I don't use TikTok, so I don't know what goes on over there, but I've always been afraid of that because I figured I feel like people's attention spans are getting shorter and shorter and shorter that I don't want to like encourage people to have a shorter <laughs> attention span than what they already have, because it's not going to help you learn if you're less inclined to watch a 20 minute video because you want a one minute video. It's, it's entertainment, but I, I don't know. I just, yeah. it feels like kind of a race to the bottom that I don't want to be a part of. Um, and yeah, sometimes I can see something that they did. I'm like, oh, it was that video that really, that really, you know, went viral and made people find out about their channel. And then other times I'm like, I have no idea how, how it's blowing up, or I have no idea why that channel isn't blowing up. I'll find some treasure that's like, this artist mm -hmm. is so talented. Their instructions are so clear. Their photography is so beautiful. Why aren't they huge? You know, it's just... It, yeah, I don't know. I try to dissect it and I can't, sometimes I'm like, okay, that makes sense. And sometimes you're like, why is this person's not like, they're doing the same thing as this person. This person's getting tons of views and it's like same, everything seems very similar. And this one over here is just not, I, I can't, it makes no sense to me. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder, is it like, could it possibly be the location the creator is in? And maybe if they're in certain countries, to. they don't, it's not, it's supposed, not to? supposed to. I mean, there may, 
there may be that that's more of an advertisement thing where that could affect something, you know, where you are, the ads yeah. will, will be affected by that. So how much they're making per video would be affected. But as far as getting the actual views, it's not supposed to. So oh, interesting. That's yeah, I don't I don't know. Yeah, well, I'm glad that you've stuck with YouTube for so long because we get to enjoy your videos. <laughs> yeah, you too. I love your vlogs. I like watching the vlogs. Like, I like just listening oh, to like you talk stuff. about whatever while I'm doing, you know, cleaning the house or whatever. I just like le having that on in the background. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, those are fun. I started them during the pandemic just because it, everything was so weird and nobody knew what was what was what. And I, I was thinking about the fireside chats that, you know, they did during the Depression, the mm -hmm. president did during the Depression. And I thought, well, I do have a little spot of normalcy and lightheartedness where we're not going to talk about um, sickness or drama or anything like that. And, and people's like, please keep, please keep doing this after the pandemic's over. You know, this is fun. This is how I want to start my weekend. So I'm still doing it. I recorded one right before yeah. we started our inter our interview here so yeah i love it's them. fun you definitely keep up with yeah. it because they entertain me that's for sure oh thank you so much oh my gosh well we've been talking for over an hour and we've probably <laughs> crammed about four hours in of content <laughs> with how quickly we speak <laughs> uh so before we go is there anything else you want to let folks know about any anything you've got coming up that we would be excited to hear about uh I'll be in Aquashella in May in Dallas. If you want to join there, Aquashella.com will have the dates and where to get the tickets. I know it's in May. That's the extent of my knowledge. Um, and live streams every Wednesday night where I will walk you through a beginner project. Just don't stick with the beginner stuff. Do some of those, but do the advanced <laughs> stuff too. Oh, awesome. Are you going to be um, selling your artwork at Aquashella or teaching? Yeah, I'll or... set up a booth. It'll be a booth where I sell prints. Um, I don't bother Wonderful. dragging originals out. They don't don't sell that much of those. So I go more for the fun of it to see all my fish friends because it's, um, yes, my fish friends. That, yes, that is what I meant. Um, but the, it's saltwater and freshwater. A few amphibians and reptiles are there, but it's like a big event. And they also have a lot of marine or artists that create marine or freshwater work. So um, it's just, it's a lot of fun. I just hang out and watch everybody walk by, judge their outfits as they're walking by. Um, you know, fun times. Um, but yeah, I bring a bunch of prints and occasionally I share my booth with another friend. I don't know if my photographer friend is going to be there um, sharing my booth with me, but yeah. So if you want to come talk, hang out, talk art, whatever, I will be there. And you get to look at fish and coral and all kinds of other cool stuff at the event. Oh, nice. So where is that located? Dallas. Dallas. Okay. I'm sorry if I, I missed that. Um, wonderful. I will put links to everything in the uh, show notes and video description, including Aquashella. So you can go stalk Lisa in person if you like. <laughs> Um, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. This has been a really lively and fun conversation. And um, it's always great to catch up with you. Yeah, you too. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for listening, guys. Um, you can find all of the information we talked about in the show notes or video description if you're watching this on YouTube, because you can see our bright, shining faces on YouTube, or you can listen in whatever podcast app. As always, please share it with friends if you think of anybody that might enjoy this conversation. And as always, happy crafting and bye.